Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Can I, on behalf of the Policy Institute, welcome you to the second of Professor Mosier's lectures in 2015. Um, Professor Mosier has been a visiting professor at King's for a number of years, and this is the third of his lecture series. Um, the first focused on the West in the Asian century, the second the triumph of fear, and this year's series focuses on what went wrong. In the second lecture in this, this year, Professor Mosier will, bring, will focus on what went wrong with Europe, a question of major interest in the UK, both before May this year and potentially, depending on who wins the election, um, after May. At this stage, I pass over to Professor Mosier, um, and we sit and wait with interest to what he's got to tell us. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I, I realize uh, when asking the question what went wrong uh, with Europe that being on the other side of the channel, uh, I might have had a different starting point and maybe therefore a different way of thinking. Um, on this side of the channel, nothing went wrong with Europe for a lot of British citizens. Everything went according to plan, which is badly. Why should it have been otherwise? Since Europe, from the very start, was an utopia. And um, I think in the British view of Europe, of course, uh, you have to combine um, geography, the insularity of the vision, history, and in particular the fact that unlike the rest of Europe, you were clearly on the winning side of history in World War II. And uh, nothing failing more than success, uh, you thought for a long time, that only the losers or those uh, who were really on the dark side of history or those who were on the gray side of history needed Europe, but not Great Britain. And uh, today I, I still feel that sense of nearly superiority, if not sometime condescendence. Why should we go down in life? Why should we endanger our democratic values for an artificial construction uh, that does not translate the reality of the time? Let Europeans dream about Europe. We have the world. I think in 2015, this vision seemed to me even more anachronistic and false than before. I think, and this will be uh, the subject of my lecture today, that confronted with three ism, which are jihadism, Putinism, and populism, to use David Cameron's sentence and to return it in another direction, we are really better together. And the formula that applied with success to keep Scotland within Great Britain should apply politically, intellectually, to the maintenance of Great Britain within the European Union. This is my little political warning. I move on now to uh, something different, and which is my own thinking as a continental European on what's wrong with Europe today. 
And I think the first problem could be summarized in a very quick, simplistic formula, which is Europe does not have naturally geopolitics in her DNA. In fact, Europe dreamt of herself as the model, the leader of a post-modern world. Hard power was for the past and it nearly destroyed Europe. But soft power is the present and even more the future. Europe will lead the way in two directions. Norms, we are the continent of norms. And we are destined, especially because of the tragedy we went through and we transcended, to reinvent the concept of sovereignty for the 21st century. Europe as a postmodern actor, Europe as a model for the rest of the world. Europe, the model of reconciliation, which makes Asians dream. Europe as the model of a more human form of capitalism, which is the answer to uh, the American uh, way into uh, greater and more unacceptable inequalities. The problem with that vision is that it confronted the test of reality and to a large extent failed uh, because we are not entering a postmodern world and it could be in fact easy to say that the problem with Europe is that she is confronted at her, at her boundaries by pre-modern forces who see the world in pure power politics, Russia, or who see the world in uh, pre-Westphalian type of consideration like in the Middle East. And so, in a way, there was a mismatch between the dream of Europe and the reality of the world. And we have to understand the triple challenge which we are faced with from the south, from the east, and probably more seriously even from within. How can we successfully face the external challenges if we failed to face the internal one? The answer is that it cannot be done. For more than 10 years, between 1990 and 2000, the European debate was dominated by two words, enlargement and deepening. We had to enlarge for a combination of geopolitical, economical, but above all, ethical reasons. Europe had been artificially divided, kidnap Europe, peacefully returned into Europe. Geography and history had to be reunited but confronted with the challenge 
of enlargement, many Europeans reacted in a defensive manner. Yes, we should enlarge, but first we should deepen. We should strengthen our institutions before getting more members into our club. In fact, I must admit that the Brits were more open to enlargement than any others. For some, it was an alibi to refuse deepening. And the more, the merrier. Why don't we engage with Turkey? Why don't we move as far as Russia? We need the great Europe and not the most integrated one. A vision, of course, which collided with uh, the Franco-German vision of things. And when it came to enlargement, there was a difference between France and Germany. France felt that enlargement, especially to the east, would move the center of gravity of Europe towards Berlin. So there were more reluctances in Paris. Uh, and uh, you could feel that. But in fact, today, the problem is not a wider Europe, wider. It's a wilder Europe. It's very wild next to us. And uh, by enlarging, we came closer to very difficult situations. Europe, when it came to security, had traditionally defined three answers. Europe saw herself endowed with three cards. The problem in 2015 is that the three cards defined by Europe have to be seriously updated. The three cards I'm about to describe have all deep fallacies today. What were those three cards? US protection. Europeans felt that in case of a problem, there was an ultimate life insurance constituted by the United States of America. It was all right with the British, the closest ally of Washington it was all right with the Germans, who felt that after the 12 years of barbarism they went through, it was good that their power should be focused on economic and not <coughs> military side. It was all right with Scandinavia. At some point, one spoke of the Denmarkization the Hollanditis, the Magna Helvetia. It was slightly less all right with the French, but by the end of the day, we too were very happy to have the American behind us. The problem is that America is much less interested in Europe than America was. And since the adventures which ended badly in the Middle East, America is much less enthusiastic at being the gendarme of the world. When she has to, she must do it. But she's telling the Europeans in so many ways, you are on the first line now. You are on your own. Maybe you have to become serious. Maybe you have to rethink your priorities. Can you become a hard power? Can you leave the world of Venus to enter, even at the margin, the world of Mars, to use the categories of Robert Kagan? The second card of Europe worked extremely well. 
was the card of enlargement. Europe works, so to speak, by capillarity. The secret weapon of Europe to impose peace on its neighborhood was a simple formula. You want to join us? Behave of yourself. We are a club of democracy, rule of law, peace, capitalist rules, well accepted. You understood those rules, now practice them. And in fact, it worked. It worked in particular in the Balkans. Croatia is in the European Union, Serbia will probably enter at some point. By the end of the day, the war in the Balkans was solved by a combination of the hard power of the United States and the soft power of Europe, even if, the soft po if, if Europeans contributed uh, their hard power to the solution of the problem. But of course, we cannot use that weapon of enlargement against every country that misbehave. It is not the vocation of Europe to include all the countries of Europe. And so we defined a third card which has been summarized under the concept of neighboring policy. In French, bon voisinage, good neighboring. And this policy was defined to create a specific relation with countries that we didn't think were deemed to enter Europe in terms of the European Union, but who should behave as the outside members of the club, the invited guest that sometime you would accept, though they would not have been granted full membership. And it worked through two special arrangements, one towards the south, which was called the Union for Mediterranean. In fact, it started very badly as the Union of Mediterranean, Union de la Méditerranée, which immediately provoked the uh, fury and uh, legitimate uh, shock of Germany, who was presented with the plan without being informed of it in advance. And then, in 2009, we had the Eastern Partnership towards the countries of the East that were not supposed to join the European Union but would have special relationship with us. Georgia, Ukraine being one of the two key countries. And of course, uh, we had a specific country in our mind, Turkey. We wanted to give something to Turkey, accept membership into the European Union. And of course, it did not please Turkey at all. You invited us 40 years ago in your club. We did a lot of things, and now you are offering us this bone to chew, are you joking? But the problem with that neighborhood policy was that suddenly two events make them deeply irrelevant. The Arab Spring, and especially the failure of the Arab Spring, and then the Ukrainian 
crisis. How can you develop a good neighborhood policy when there is violence, explosion, war, engulfing those countries? And we've seen in the Ukrainian crisis the evolution of the situation. What started as a competition between two trade packs, Euro-Asian formula of Putin, Eastern partnership of the European Union, became brutally a geopolitical struggle between two conflicting vision of sphere of influences. If Europe does not have the adequate tools to face those challenges, she is weakened from inside in a deep way by the rise of populist forces who are challenging the very essence of Europe and, in fact, the very nature of its democratic regime. It's very difficult to make comparison between UKIP in Great Britain, the National Front in France, uh, the Golden Dawn in Greece, uh, and whatever. Zobik, Zobik and or Fides in Hungary, each populist force is specific. And it would be very dangerous to create an amalgam amongst them, except they share something in common, which has been defined by the French political scientist Dominique Regnier under the formula patrimonial populism. What they are fighting for is the preservation of what they feel belong to them. Work should not be given to foreign workers, identity, why should I be submitted to the threat of others? And of course, they all share a detestation for the European construction, which is the beginning of the other in their deeply anti-elitist <coughs> movement. They are xenophobic, but xenophobia probably means something different in each country. And by the end of the day, they don't like Europe because they don't like democracy. They are deeply, uh, it, it, in fact, it's difficult to say, but in my country, France, uh, there is clearly a return of the perfume of the 1930s with uh, the National Front sharing anti-Islam open statements with more hidden anti-Semitic statement and pronunciation. Whereas I don't think there is an element of anti-Semitism in UKIP in Great Britain, or if it does exist, it's very well hidden. But those forces have something in common. They are gaining ground. And they are gaining ground because traditional political elites in Europe have all failed. Failed to define with clarity the European project. What is it we are fighting for? Fail to define with clarity, and I know it's a very difficult, the borders of Europe. Till where are we destined to go? And 
somewhere their popularity now stems from the desire for new something new on sunday the national front may well appear in the next local election as the first party of france well above the traditional conservative or the socialist party of course these are local elections but they are paving the ground for more serious elections and what is striking is that these forces are undermining the ability of european to come together at the very moment they need so much to come together because faced with jihadism or putinism we cannot succeed alone now jihadism i will look at it carefully in my next lecture which is next week when i will study what went wrong with the middle east but let me focus a little more on putinism i think when we look at russia today we have to integrate three important element three important consideration first the need to understand them and that means understanding their history but also understanding the nature of their power and second we have to set up limits to putin's ambition understanding them means two things not only the culture of humiliation which they are exploiting to the nausea uh, the way iran did it by saying mossadegh 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 in any negotiation on nuclear arms uh, or nuclear whatever uh, mossadegh being the name of the prime minister of iran who was removed with the help of the cia in 1953 the russians are saying you humiliated us in the 1990s you disregarded us you took us for granted enough but beyond that there's something more important to understand and integrate and that is what ukraine represents in russian history in russian culture and from that standpoint there's a very good book by a british historian orlando figues dedicated to the war in crimea the war that led to uh, the famous tennyson poem on the charge of the light brigade but if there was mrs nightingale on the british side there was tolstoy on the russian side and uh, tolstoy served in the siege of sebastopol and he wrote war and peace inspired by the crimean war who led between 1853 and 1856 to the deaths of nearly one million men including half a million russian and in the siege of sebastopol nearly 150,000 russian died and since then the russian have celebrated this glorious defeat and when the soviet union collapsed i remember being in moscow discussing with my russian friends who were most of them at that time dissidents they were so happy but when it came to ukraine or belorussia 
I realize they didn't accept the departure of these two countries. They considered them as part of their identity. And so it's important for us to understand the roots of the Russian position. But understanding the roots of their position does not mean accepting what they are doing. Combining uh, brutal force with absolute deceit. The ambitions of imperial Russia with the tactics of the Soviet Union at its worst. And so we do have to resist. And unfortunately, we are deeply divided on that issue. There are those who speak tough, like the British, but act by the end of the day relatively mildly, and those who speak very soft and in fact can nearly be considered as ally of Russia in that struggle. And it's clearly the case of Orthodox Greece, but it goes beyond when you see the uh, uh, understanding of Italy or Spain. And from that standpoint, there is, of course, uh, a geographic divide between those who in the south fear more Daesh, uh, ISIS, and those who in the north and the east fear much more the threat of uh, the uh, return of imperial Russia, which leads me to a major question. Is it purely a dream to consider that Europe has to return to be partly a hard power? Because soft power will not suffice. Is there enough awareness in Europe of the nature of the threat confronting us in order to arose a sense of responsibility. Well, it's very interesting to follow the British debate. Here is a country speaking tough to Moscow, but when it comes to its defense budget, uh, not acting in accordance to his words. And of course, seen from France, which is not doing much better, when it comes to defense budget, we try to analyze the British attitude. And we say, well, your ability to intervene and your appetite for intervention outside has been largely destroyed by Blair's unfortunate adventure in Iraq and the rejection of that policy in the years that followed. In France, you have less of that kind of rejection simply because we didn't join that war. Because for once, history probably proved us right. Saddam Hussein did not have weapons of mass destruction. But it's useless to go back to the past. The real question today is, what is Germany about to do? What are European countries in their majority about to do? If tomorrow, which is likely to occur, the city of Mariupol is seized by independentist pro-Russian forces, in the east of Ukraine, what will be the reaction of Europe and the West at large? Should we send weapons? Or should we stick to a policy of hard economic sanctions, 
meaning cancelling the access of Russia to SWIFT and IBAN, imposing on Russia the kind of sanctions we have imposed on Iran with some kind of success. But of course, this again means understanding what is behind Russia's ambition beyond history and culture which Putin plays extremely well. Could it be a combination of fear and hope? Fear of the contag contagion of the Ukrainian model. Well, I've been teaching for more than 10 years at the uh, College of Europe in Natolin, and I had many of my students during the Maidan days calling me, writing mails to me, and saying, listen, you have to understand our position. If we have to choose between Poland and Belarusia as a future, it is obvious we are going to choose <coughs> Poland. And in fact, this is something which the Europeans have been playing very badly. We've been overwhelmed with failure stories and underplaying success story. I mean, in 1990, for example, Poland and Ukraine have the, s have the same level of wealth. In 2015, Poland is in another world than Ukraine. Enlargement worked, even for those who stayed at the back of the class. Even Romania and Bulgaria are much better off than Belarusia or Moldavia, for that matter. So we did not play that card, and to some extent, it's Putin reminding us of the threat that our unpublicized success represent for him. Can we do it? I don't know. Uh, we are probably not going in that direction. But we have to do it. There is no other way around. I would say European have to wake up to the reality of a geopolitical harsh world in which soft power alone will not suffice. And this is the answer to the question. For many years, Europeans have lost their public opinion, their citizens, because they concentrated on the question how to build Europe, whereas citizens were expecting the question why to do it, and now how to do it. This is the key issue. And now we have, a, in a very simplistic, harsh, obvious manner, why Europe? Because faced with jihadism, Putinism, and populism, we can only do it together and not alone. Shall probably stop here for the moment and move on to the question, uh, the time for questions. Dominic, thank you. I think you've given everybody quite a lot to think about. Can I start asking for some questions? It'd be grateful if people could identify themselves and if they could keep their questions fairly short so we can get the maximum number in. So, gentlemen, right in the middle. I'm sorry to start in such a difficult place. Uh, 
Thank you. My name is Charles Jenkins. I'm a commentator on Europe, uh, inside EU. Um, uh, I would just like to ask what actually, a bit more, what could be done in Ukraine? Because um, we don't want, I think, to get involved in a full-scale war uh, with Russia and Ukraine. Um, uh, is there any possibility of international peacekeepers um, supervising the mints? Presumably they would have to be from outside Europe because Europe is biased. Um, but I wonder, is there any, what, what practical measures can we do now? We've made all the mistakes we have, but we where we are. Well, I had talks with Russian experts <clears throat> last week in Paris. Um, it was very interesting to listen to them, uh, basically in private. They were convinced that Ukraine was doomed, that uh, the military was about to collapse, followed by the economy, followed by the state. I think what we have to do right now is to prove them wrong. Uh, and in particular, to keep Ukraine above the water by seriously helping them now, immediately, as much as we can, economically speaking. Some people speak of a Marshall Plan. Uh, I, I don't like those kind of uh, formulas that do not correspond uh, to a real historical valid comparison. Uh, but I do believe we must make a huge effort to keep Ukraine breathing and to make sure that if Russia were to go beyond uh, we uh, would take the economic sanctions, which I mentioned before. Wh what strikes me is the fact that in the debate on Ukraine, we forget the essential. The problem is not Ukraine. The problem is the nature of power in Russia, the curse of Russia is the divorce between the greatness of Russia's culture and the sheer mediocrity of Russia's political culture. This combination of brutality, cruelty, deceit. Um, I remember <clears throat> at the time of the Soviet Union in the late 80s, I was walking in the park of Versailles, so there were no mic uh, ready to catch what I was saying with a Soviet dignitary and we went a bit philosophizing. We, we, we were philosophers uh, Café du Commerce philosophers we spoke about the 20th century that was about to end and he says to me you have to realize that no one suffered more in this century than the Soviet people no one had more casualties in World War I and World War II than the Soviet people. But you must realize, too, that the Soviet regime killed more of its citizens than all the enemies of the Soviet Union taken together. 86, 87, in the Park of Versailles, it was interesting. We were already in the Gorbachev era. Uh, nothing has changed. Uh, there's no consideration for the citizens. The happiness of the citizens is nothing compared with the greatness of the nation to a point where it is totally unbalanced. And we have to integrate that into our thinking. We have to see that so many Europeans today are dealing with Russia the way they dealt in the 1930s with Nazi Germany. It's not a nice regime, but we have to understand you don't choose friends when you have such an enemy in front of you. 
in the 1930s, it was communism and the Soviet Union. And today it's jihadism and uh, ISIS. There is that kind of thinking which we have to resist because it is exactly the worst trend which led to so many terrible things at the end of the 1930s. Uh, Linda Korsha, um, it concerns me that you uh, don't rec appear to recognise at all or, or acknowledge the that the fact that to the extent to which the EU's agenda is dominated by corporations, um, and and how that is linked to the complete disillusionment as people recognise that, and including the role of the EU in causing the Ukraine civil war and particularly the role of the Trade Commission, which is the, the unacknowledged heavyweight part of the, of the EU. And, and so they were there as the, as the agents doing that. Uh, whoever they were working for, clearly corporations. Um, so this is, this is where it came from. I mean, corporations like uh, Monsanto is in there big time, for instance. So it's not even particularly EU corporations that the... Um, that that push from Brussels is for. Uh, I've, I've actually been asking both in Brussels and here with the UK uh, government where the push came from for the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement with Ukraine and suddenly no one was responsible. No one was to put their hand up and say that they were pushing it. Um, similarly, your references to your own concepts about the UK don't seem to recognise that when you say UK government, and when you say UK, I presume you're talking UK government, that the UK government is in fact um, the transnational financial services of the City of London. That's who our government represents, works for. Um, yes, no, I think uh, there is an element of truth in what you said initially. I'm not sure uh, the uh, European Union negotiators um, behaved in the most cautious or intelligent manner. But this was a pretext that was seized by Russia. The fall of Yanukovych took everybody by surprise. We did not decide to topple Yanukovych. It is the Ukrainian people in Kiev that decided that because of the total incompetence and corruption of the regime. And when uh, uh, his palace was uh, open and taken after by the public, we realized to what an extent corruption was ridiculous. And uh, the majority of the Ukrainian people chose freely to move west. And it's part of the game, it, it's fundamental. I mean, given the complexity, uh, you can say, well, uh, there are so many minorities in this part of Europe. I want you to join me as a minority. Russia speaking to Ukraine. Why should I accept you to join them as a minority? This is the thinking. And somewhere you have two visions of the world. Uh, the people presently in power in Kiev are different from the one who took power after the Orange Revolution. They've learned. They are still very weak, but they are not inherently corrupt as the one who took power more than 10 years ago. We have to acknowledge that. And uh, if you concentrate too much 
on conspiracy theories, on the transnational forces uh, uh, dictating their law to government, <coughs> I think you miss the simplicity of history. It's less complex than that when it comes to values. Hi, my name's George Curry. I, I work in the British political sphere. Um, can I first of all just thank you for a really fascinating analysis of, of Europe's problems and, and, and more broadly the European project. Um, I wonder though, it seems to me that your justification for the European project is somewhat negative, and I mean that in the sort of, the sort of liberal sense. You're offering freedoms from as justifications, freedoms from an imperialist Russia, freedoms from a, a, a jihadism we don't want to embrace. Um, but I wonder, can Europe offer a more positive message to, to European citizens to answer that question, why Europe? Can it, an, can it, can it pose the, the, an answer to the question, um, what can Europe do for you, as it were? Yes, the problem is, uh, with experience, you realize that the positive argument works much less well than the negative one. History proves that to do something for is much more difficult than to do something against. Um, the euro was supposed to be the starting point of a spillover process. Since we would have a common single currency, we would have a common single foreign policy. It didn't work that way. It didn't work that way yesterday, precisely in the climate of that followed uh, the end of the Cold War. Well, of course, there was 9-11. Uh, you had the terrible tragedies in Madrid and in London. But they were not perceived as attacks on Europe. They were perceived as attacks on Spain or on Great Britain. Paradoxically, the recent attack on Paris was more perceived as an attack on Europe than the two previous ones. It's not a question of the number of casualties. There were less casualties. It's the question of the context and the question of the nature of the targets. Many people felt concerned by the fact that caricaturists incarnating, sometimes in a very bad taste, uh, the spirit of freedom were murdered. So, yes, I would like to share your positive vision and to say, well, we are building Europe as uh, the, citadel, the city on the hill, the way uh, uh, the American Republic uh, was built. But it's not there. It's not there in European history because we went through so many catastrophes and it's not there because of, of the geopolitical environment in which we live. So I'm not trying to scare people. It's not my goal. I'm trying to say to Europeans, wake up. There are, on the other side of the Mediterranean or on the other side of your boundaries at the east, forces that want to kill you or to control you. And at that very moment where you have forces that want to kill you in the south or control you in the, south, in the east, there are forces within you that are tempting you to lose your soul, to lose your sense of values disregarding what makes your difference, democracy and the rule of law.
Hi, my name's uh, Tom Jeffrey. I did the News Hub. Um, I think I agree with you when you say that democracy, you know, in a, in a very confusing geopolitical situation, <coughs> democracy has to be the standard you use for evaluating what's going on. So, you know, we look at the, the situation in Ukraine and we say, well, a majority of Ukrainians voted for a certain kind of pro-EU uh, government. But I'm not, I'm not 100%. Um, and I, w I wondered whether you'd sort of consider an alternative point of view, which goes everywhere, you know, I including within Europe, um, communities and, 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 and polities are trying to wriggle free of a certain kind of authoritarian statism, right? So whether that's 84.5 of, of, of Scots who voted for something different to happen in Scotland, um, you know, even though the referendum motion didn't pass, whether it's you know, Catalonians who are not given the opportunity to, to think of a future outside of uh, the Spanish state. You know, even whether it's, it's Kurds, right, who are, who are trying to imagine a political future outside of a very, you know, draconian uh, Turkish clampdown trying to integrate them into Turkey or outside of a failing Iraq. Um, you know, what if once we get past this kind of Manichaean light and dark democratic Europe versus authoritarian um, Russia worldview that still kind of has some kind of uh, hangover from, from, from the Cold War. You know, what if the people of Luhansk and, and Donetsk actually see some kind of future that more accurately represents their sense of identity um, outside of the NATO bloc? Yeah. Should we, do, do we need to take that seriously at all? Well, when it comes to the Ukrainian question as such, um, I agree with you. Um, the problem is that Russia has redraw by force the map of Europe in a totally unacceptable way. We have to find a compromise to accommodate the identity quest of the people of Donetsk, probably through some kind of federal system. But the seizure by force is in the European territory completely unacceptable. When it comes to the beginning of your question, I would say the problem today is to become larger, not to become smaller. Uh, in a world which is moving east, in a world where we are surrounded by the threats I describe, Europe has to become tougher, more coherent, more united. So we need more Europe and not less and more divisive uh, realities. It's, this is, uh, in a way, in a very simplistic manner uh, to present things. But I would say that it's not Europe in the name of liberal economy. It's not Europe for the sake of more social, uh, humanistic values. It's Europe for the sake of geopolitics, because we have no choice for the very reasons I presented. <coughs> Thank you, Dominic. Dennis McShane, a former Europe minister. I have to say, when you want to get voters going and young people going, tell them to get going for geopolitics. It's not an obvious no. uh, sell. And I, while I agree about the illegal annexation of Crimea, don't let us dig ourselves into our own grave. We've accepted the illegal occupation and annexation of northern Cyprus, a UN member state, without making too much fuss. I could cite other examples. So if the notion is a rollback from Crimea, that isn't frankly, what we should be spending a huge amount of energy in insisting upon. I'm sorry. Uh, Putin is not a mediocrity. He's a very nasty, very unpleasant, very corrupt, very violent, bad influence on the world. The mediocrity problem, surely, Dominique, is in the capitals of Europe. So I'd like you to tell us which of our current great leaders, Mr. Cameron, Mr. Rajoy, Mr. Hollande, Mr. Renzi, Mr. Tsipras, uh, 
grabs you in the morning and gets you out of bed saying, yes, <laughs> habemus dux, we have a leader at last. <laughs> that's a tough one. <laughs> um, that's a tough one. Uh, let, let, let me try to think uh, first uh, to answer your first question. Um, I would say there is a difference between Turkey and Cyprus and Russia and Europe. I don't think Turkey was going to move somewhere else after annexing half of Cyprus. You don't know. I mean, uh, Putin said very specifically many times that the worst catastrophe of the 20th century was the disintegration of the Soviet Union. What does he really have in mind? He sees us as decadent, powerless, whatever, uh, divided. I mean, he, I mean, he has a formula that comes back all the time, which is reported to me by my friends. He says, look at the West. Gay marriage and a black president in the United States. How can you go lower? This kind of xenophobia towards, but that's him. That's exactly what he thinks. So somewhere we have to set up limits. I don't know how, but if we simply accept passively this continuous growth of force, where will we end? Uh, on the, your second question, <laughs> well, I don't have an answer, but I, I can give you a little experience, a story. Uh, we were a group of 18 Frenchmen meeting Chancellor Angela Merkel a year ago in Berlin. We spent two hours with her. When we came out of that meeting, we all said to ourselves, well, for nearly the last 20 years, no French president has been a match to a German chancellor. And that is probably one of the reasons why the gap has been widening between our two countries. I think Angela Merkel did a good job on the whole. If I were to open my heart, I would say that I think Alain Juppé in France who came to Kings uh, in uh, June or May, uh, would probably do a good job for France, be a statesman that would uh, impose reforms. So people exist. You have to elect them. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Gentlemen. Uh, Sandy Johnston, the Ministry of Defence. Um, the current European security strategy dates from 2003. Uh, in 2008, under the French presidency, we tried to renew it, uh, and we failed. We produced a report on the implementation of the 2003 strategy. Federica Mogherini has now declared her intention to produce a revised strategy, um, launching in June this year and taking 12 months. How do you rate her chances of success? An even more difficult question <laughs> than uh, the, the, the one you raise. I, I don't know. My honest answer is that I don't know. I sense a growing awareness in European capitals of the seriousness, and I repeat that word, of the geopolitical situation. But Dennis is absolutely right. Uh, can you mobilize people on geopolitics? No, unless they feel that their immediate future will depend upon it. 
And that is where pedagogy plays a role. Pedagogy by opposition to demagogy, which leads to populism. Populists can say, you have been lying to us for the last 20 years. You make promises which you did not keep. Why should I trust you? Left or right, you are the same. Let's invent someone who never was in power. But pedagogy could work with the right people. Pedagogy worked before. I can think of uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt preparing America between uh, 1938 and 1941. I can think of Abraham Lincoln. I mean, I can think by the end of the day, Churchill. Uh, so no, I, I'm, it, the success or the failure will come of the, will depend upon the success of the, of the failure of the political leaders in the respective capitals of Europe. Dominic, thank you very, very much for a very thought provoking session. We, we look forward to welcoming you, ev uh, welcoming everybody next week for the third lecture in the series. Thank you.